Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Antonio Venosa. I'm the Executive Director of the European Transport Safety Council. And uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, PIN webinar on uh, reducing road deaths among uh, motorcycle uh, um, riders. Uh, um, a few housekeeping notes. The webinar is being uh, recorded. And uh, also, you can uh, ask uh, questions on, uh, uh, by using the Q&A function of uh, uh, the system. And uh, we'll try and select the best of these questions and answer them uh, during the two Q&A opportunities that we have uh, at the end of the first session before the break and uh, uh, at the end of the uh, second session. Um, we are here in uh, the framework of the uh, PIN uh, um, project of ETSC, uh, for which we would be, uh, um, we would like to um, gratefully acknowledge the contribution of our partners, uh, DDR, the German Road Safety Council, Toyota Motor Europe, TME, STA, the Swedish Transport Administration, the Norwegian Public Roads Administration, um, CETA, the International Motor Vehicle Inspection Committee, and the MAFRE Foundation. Without them, of course, these activities and all uh, what we do in the PIN project would not be uh, possible. Uh, we have two sessions. Uh, uh, we start immediately with the first one, and uh, uh, I would like to um, give uh, the floor for uh, some words of uh, welcome to uh, Chark Kreuzinger from uh, Toyota Motor Europe. Now, before you ask me this on uh, the chat, Toyota does not manufacture motorcycles. They are not <laughs> intending to diversify the strategies. Uh, the reason why they're here, you would very much imagine, is uh, uh, because they have been uh, uh, supporting the PIN project since the very beginning, uninterruptedly since uh, 2006. And uh, we are uh, delighted, therefore, to give them the floor to say why they support the PIN, why they like it, and uh, uh, then we can uh, um, continue with uh, the webinar. Tiark, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Antonio, for the uh, introduction. And you already said it. Uh, my name is Jack Hotzing. I'm in charge of uh, road safety at Toyota Motor Europe and have been involved with uh, this precise uh, work with ETSC for many years. I personally, and also we as a company, we value the safety contribution and also the sincere mindset of safety uh, of ETSC. Um, of course, that means sometimes because we are from different corners of the mobility, we have discussions and that's good because without discussion, you have hardly any progress. Um, and uh, as for the topic of today, power two wheelers are a very important safety concern at the moment. Uh, as you will hear today on the numbers, they are very clear showing that it is necessary to, to improve. Uh, we as uh, one of the road uh, contributors to, to road uh, mobility, of course, have to acknowledge that very much. Eurencap has also already acknowledged that. Uh, they have included that in their assessment. And maybe we are not producing motorbikes anywhere, but we have already announced alternative mobility solutions. Uh, for example, a cargo bike uh, that we are already uh, that is already launched. But we also think about hubs that uh, will support wheelchair users, uh, and also we are going into more different levels of mobility. So I think that uh, for us, motorbikes are a very important partner on the road, and therefore we have to consider how, they, how we can protect them better. So uh, without further waste of your time, um, thank you very much for that event. I'm delighted to hear more details about what's going on in Europe and uh, wish you all a very uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chark. Thank you. And it's true that even though you do not manufacture motorbikes, uh, the uh, relationship between different uh, uh, road users is important and you do uh, take them into account when uh, um, working on uh, um, your vehicles, on your um, products. Um, the first presentation today will be from uh, my um, colleague, Jenny Carson, who is uh, a PIN program manager. In March 2023, we have uh, uh, published this uh, report, which is, uh, of course, freely available for uh, download on the ETSC website. Uh, lots of data, lots of information, and uh, um, Jenny will uh, um, take us through this uh, um, interesting report. Thank you very much, Antonio. I uh, just share my screen. So yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jenny Carson. I'm program manager for the uh, PIN program here at uh, ETSC. Um, and I'm going to talk to you through the some of the findings of the report, um, some of the um, countermeasures and recommendations that ETSC proposes. 
So first, a little bit about the PIM program for anybody that is new to the PIM program. Um, so the PIM program stands for the Road Safety Performance Index program. It's a program that involves uh, 32 countries, so the 27 EU member states, and then also the UK, Norway, Switzerland, Israel, and the Republic of Serbia. And it's really about benchmarking the road safety performance of those countries. But it's also about sharing good practice, um, and that's really the focus, I think, of events uh, like today. So we have a steering group that guides us. We have somebody in each of the 32 countries that helps us with um, the data and the information, and we're very grateful to them. Every year, we publish an annual report in June, really looking at the progress towards the, the EU target of reducing road deaths by 50% and also serious injuries. And um, throughout the year, we publish two thematic reports, such as the one that I'm going to talk to you today about um, the road safety of power two wheelers. And we also hold uh, pin talks, such as this one. Antonio already mentioned it. You can see there at the bottom uh, the logos of the uh, sponsors of the program. And uh, we're very grateful to them for their support. So as Antonio mentioned, I'm going to talk to you today about a um, the report that we published in March uh, this year. So firstly, I think the scale of the problem, what did we find with the data? Over 45,000 power two wheeler users were killed on European roads in the last 10 years. On the right there, you can see um, the graph to show the progress since 2011 um, in reducing those uh, road deaths. And we can see quite clearly that um, moped deaths have declined more quickly than motorcycle deaths and also um, other road deaths as well. So what can we see here when we look at um, each of the PIN countries individually? So here we're looking at the average annual change over the last 10 years in the, the PIN countries. And we can see here for motorcycles that on average uh, across the EU26, they've reduced by 2% uh, each year. When we turn to uh, mopeds, we can see a slightly larger reduction. So echoing a bit what we saw in that first uh, graph uh, at the beginning. So moped deaths have reduced uh, more quickly on average every year, so by 6%. When it comes to looking at the road risk of um, uh, a road user, it's one of the best ways, one of the most accurate ways of looking at it is to look at distance traveled. Now, this data is notoriously difficult to get hold of. We know it even for cars um, and power two wheelers is no exception. So we share here the data that we were able to find um, from the countries that were able to provide it. Sometimes it's um, all power two wheelers, sometimes it's motorcycles, sometimes it's mopeds. But I think what we can see from this data is that um, the countries where that have overall higher levels of road safety also have um, the, the lowest uh, road risk. So I'm looking here at countries like Switzerland, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden. Um, so if you make your roads safe for, uh, for everyone, then they are also safer for uh, power two wheelers. Next, I wanted to share some data that we gathered looking at the um, the age and the progress that has been made in terms of the age of the power two wheeler users uh, killed on our roads. And here we can see um, the thick blue line is from uh, 2021 and the dotted line is from uh, 2011. Um, there's also a gender um, aspect obviously to this graph, but I think if we look at the males in particular, um, we can see that there's been a large reduction in um, the death of the 14 to 23 year old, um, in particular the males. Um, and I think it could be presumed that this could have um, been impacted, that those deaths could have been impacted um, by the uh, changes to the driving license directive, which um, introduced a graduated system. 
But also you could previously drive a moped without uh, any training um, or testing, and that has also changed. So that could also have impacted um, that data. Something that is perhaps quite surprising from this graph is the fact that this rise in the, the number of what we term midlifers um, being killed on our roads. And I think that's uh, an important message for policymakers to, to hear um, and to, uh, to consider and how to address it. I think, yeah, the gender, the, the gender aspect that you also saw on that uh, first slide is also very clearly um, seen on, on this slide here that we have. Um, looking at the proportion of male and female riders and passengers killed um, riding a motorcycle. We can see here that uh, on average, uh, from the EU average, nine out of 10 power two-wheeler users killed are males. And power two-wheeler road deaths really is uh, a male problem. Why uh, is, a, is a question that we ask. Exposure is obviously a, a factor, but are there other factors um, playing here as well? We, we don't have the answers, I don't think, um, but we just know that the, the, the male um, aspect is, is clear. Here we can look at the same proportions of um, male and female riders and uh, passengers killed uh, on mopeds. It's a slightly different picture. There's a slightly higher proportion of females um, killed, but on the whole, um, again, it it's, tends to be a male um, problem. So here we have uh, an interesting slide that the uh, EU care database uh, provides us with this data to look at the collisions in which um, power two wheeler users are killed, the types of scenarios that we see. Um, and we can see that they tend to involve both for mopeds and motorcycles, um, cars, or um, where no other vehicle is involved. Those tend to be the two um, scenarios that occur on our roads in Europe. So that's the data. That's um, what we can see from the figures. What could we do to try and mitigate against um, some of these, uh, to, to try and improve some of these, uh, the, the, the situation and the data? So we have um, a second half of our report where we look at the research um, and the knowledge that is around uh, improving power to wheeler safety. Um, and we're going to hear a lot about uh, some of that to, later today. So I think I talked about it already, this age issue. We have to ensure that um, we uh, give access to these vehicles at an appropriate age when people are uh, mature enough to, to handle them. Um, we know that, for instance, the uh, driving license directive suggests 16 to drive, uh, to give an AM license, so the smallest uh, vehicles that we have. And yet uh, in our report, we saw that uh, a large number of um, pin countries give most AM licenses to people younger than 16. Um, we have a, a graduated uh, system now within uh, the driving license directive, uh, which is uh, has been very welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a good thing, but age is still a, a factor when it comes to uh, power two-wheeler uh, road deaths. Then we carry on looking at the riders' skills and um, their training. How can we improve them to make sure that they are not only fit to ride the vehicle, but also have some of these higher level skills like assessing risk, um, those sort of um, things that you perhaps can't, don't learn just riding a vehicle, but are crucial for making decisions whilst you're you're driving a power two-wheeler. Infrastructure, we're going to hear a lot about infrastructure, um, that's infrastructure changes that can be made to make the roads safer for power two-wheeler users. Um, things like um, motorcycle-friendly guardrails, only putting guardrails where they're really necessary, um, 
There are markings that we can put on the road to guide um, motorcyclists to take a safe, the safest line, um, perhaps on a curve. There's a number of infrastructure um, changes that can be made and that we uh, talk about in our report. Improving the safety of machines. We now have uh, ABS on uh, vehicles. Um, some ADAS is coming in. Um, could there be more? We have a lot on cars. Um, also, uh, the ADAS on cars is improving the um, ability of cars to detect um, mot uh, motorcycles and mopeds. So there's there's a lot that still can be done, I think, to improve the safety machines and the technology um, is there. The issue of technical inspections. Um, not, uh, not all power to readers have to undergo a technical inspection. Yet we know in our report, we have some data about the extent of tampering and the role that tampering plays in collisions um, from some countries. So could more be done in terms of uh, technical inspections? Could those tampering, those collisions where tampering was a factor um, have been avoided had there been uh, more technical inspections? Enforcement obviously plays a role in road safety for everybody and um, the power two wheelers is no exception. There are perhaps some issues with motorcycles and mopeds not having a license at the front. They also um, have their face covered with a helmet. And um, if you have driver liability um, in your country, then this can be a factor. So um, enforcement needs to, to take account of those uh, different situations. Protective equipment, we have data in our report about helmet wearing rates. In some countries, um, it's, it's very good, it's very high. Other countries, we can see they still have um, some way to go. Lastly, I just wanted to share a few recommendations that we have um, in our report. We have many recommendations. We have them for um, member states, countries, we have them also directed at the European Union. So we have this uh, recommendation to make a practical test mandatory for obtaining an AM license. Um, at, at the moment, they have a theoretical test, but not a practical test. What about extending technical, periodic technical testing to all motorcycles, including mopeds? I mentioned it already, this issue of tampering. We call for um, member states not to lower the minimum age for solo driving of any vehicle, um, and that includes um, power two wheelers. What about making uh, ABS mandatory um, on all motorcycles? And then this issue of infrastructure, what about de developing some guidelines so that to really take up the issue of power two wheeler safety? So thank you very much. You can find our report on the uh, web link uh, there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for this uh, um, comprehensive uh, um, overview of, uh, of the situation of uh, power to wheeler safety in uh, uh, the PIN countries. There will be uh, opportunity for uh, um, questions at the end of the session, questions that we um, encourage uh, participants to ask in uh, uh, the um, Q&A uh, at the bottom of their um, screen. Uh, now, uh, of course, we need countermeasures. We need countermeasures that are uh, based on uh, sound science and uh, research. So who best than uh, a blue ribbon researcher on uh, uh, power to wheelers? And that is uh, Martin Winkelbauer from uh, uh, the Austrian Safety Board, KFV, uh, to tell us more about the uh, future of uh, uh, motorcycle safety. So, Martin, over to you. Oh, I have many thanks for this very nice introduction. Uh, by the way, it's going to be a difficult task uh, since, you know, prognosis are difficult in particular if they concern the future. However, we heard a little bit already from, uh, from uh, Jenny. Um, what might be important, I, and I'd like to go a little bit into details uh, for some of the things uh, she already said. And to do that, I want to share my screen now with you. So very nice password. This actually is the Großglockner uh, Hochalpenstraße. Well, we painted the road a little bit. Uh, more details about that later on. Um, first of all, I want to say motorcycling is a really beautiful task. 
definitely you can do it for recreation you can do it on weekends for holiday trips and even after work for a short round for recreation uh, and i did that all as you can see in the photos but it is also something else it's for many people uh, an escape from urban congestion and if I go uh, from A to B with a motorcycle, I do that because I don't want to get stuck in traffic. I don't want to look for a parking space for long. And I definitely don't want to pay for the parking space. Uh, not only that, you have cheaper operation uh, with motorcycles. So it's uh, cheaper uh, to operate, for instance, a scooter might be a little bit more expensive when, with one of the, the big motorcycles. But scooters are definitely cheaper to operate. They are more fuel efficient. I mean, my wife goes to, to work with a car uh, and takes eight and a half liters per hundred kilometers if she does it with a with a 125cc scooter. It's only two and a half liters. And uh, if the uh, swappable battery motorcycle consortium succeeds, we might have electric motorcycles with unlimited range, probably even earlier on the road than we have that with cars. So we have options here. Uh, however, um, we have to make that safe. And if we talk about safety, we always have to do talk about these two things. Uh, operating with uh, leisure and operating uh, the commuters. Um, now, what do we have in terms of options? We can do more research. We can legislate uh, measures which we already know, and we can also implement them uh, if we have legislation or even without, uh, if they are useful for themselves. We couldn't do that at national level. And if we talk about international level here in Europe, it's mainly European level, of course. So um, we must not forget that we have to address different uh, uh, groups. That means the riders, but also other road users, as we have already have heard, it is necessary that, for instance, uh, a modern uh, driver assistance systems also recognize motorcycles. Uh, the photo you see here, uh, the driver actually survived happily. It was the trainer of a road safety course when the bus came along and not one of his pupils. But I'm going to tell you more about that later on. Okay. If you want to do a safety work, you always have to know your target group. So what you see in this picture, and I hope you can see my mouse here in the early 90s, when you did something for motorcycle riders, it was quite easy. I mean, you had to address the group between 18 and 24. Very easy task. Then we did something about this group. We actually implemented graduated licensing in Austria, and that was quite successful, reducing deaths and injuries in the 18 to 19 group by 70 by 75 percent that means to a quarter and in the uh, next age group from 20 to 24 even by 50 percent however these people who acquired their license there they are still riding and they are still getting injured today you see that uh, uh, that the, the the slight red uh, area goes down here one year by one year and we still have the young group here uh, uh, who we have to address uh, with the measures we want to implement. Uh, we did a, uh, at the at the Austrian World, World Safety Board. We did an in safe in depth uh, sorry an in depth study, and what came out of that actually was two main reasons for motorcycle uh, crashes, and that was on the one hand speed, and the other one is the nice term, unexpectable behavior of other road users. And if we think about that, it's normally an issue of uh, being perceived by the other road user, or better to say, not, not perceived by the other road user, of course. And these crashes are actually so frequent that they, they have a name and they are called Smitsy. Sorry, mate, I didn't see you. That was invented somewhere in Australia. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, before we do that, uh, road alignment, a very important uh, task, side distance, distance as well, and the rest, well, they are there, but these are the most important ones, road alignment time headway also. However, if we talk about the main causes, it's speed and it's unexpected behavior. 
And let's look into details to that. If we talk about conspicuity, there is some research already done in the frame of the To Be Safe uh, project, uh, European Commission funded project. However, I don't see the implementation. We as, a, as motorcycle riders, we, are obvious, we were obviously overtaken by bicycles on the right side, you know. You can buy a, multi, a bicycle helmet with rear lights, with front lights, with brake lights, and even with turn indicators. But I don't see that with motorcycles, and it would be necessary. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, if we, uh, uh, if we see a car approaching, we have daylight landing lights, and we have two light points. And if these light points go together, we know we know that uh, the um, uh, that, that the vehicle is getting further away, but if they the the, the light spots are getting closer uh, 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 away from each other, we know this vehicle is getting closer. We can't do that with one light point a motorcycle has. So probably it wouldn't be quite good to have two points side by side, one meter eighty away from each other on a motorcycle. That pro would probably not be quite practical, uh, in particular in urban filtering. But we could have the light points in vertical position. We could do more about it, but I don't see these vehicles on the road. Probably we need a little, little bit more research on that. We have proof that high visibility clothing is quite effective in uh, reducing crashes. Now let's talk a little bit about speed. I suppose that excessive speed is not really the problem with motorcycles. Uh, uh, speed gets dangerous if it turns into in being inappropriate for the situations. Those are the typical single vehicle crashes where a, a motorcycle rider, rider went too fast into a curve. Curves, this is where the crashes are with motorcycles, most of them. Um, hence, I mean, speed limits, of course they are okay, but they have to be, uh, uh, to really avoid a crash in a curve, I would have to tell the rider in advance how fast how fast he can go through this curve, which might be a difficult task. So uh, um, if we talk about uh, enforcement, neither speed, man, uh, speed cams nor average speed enforcement really will do the job. Imagine that you have a six, six, 70 kilometer a uh, uh, speed limit on a road where the first curve takes only 30 kilometers an hour. That won't help me at all. However, of course, we don't like speeding and if there are uh, uh, speed tickets, they should be cross-border enforced as well. And nevertheless, we have to raise awareness and competence. Uh, and if I talk about competence, one of the things I consider particularly important is to know about roll angle phobia. I know this is not a, a well-known English term, uh, but let me explain. Oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah. If it comes to motorcycling, I think that there are only two kinds of curves. On the one hand, there's the curves where you drive your speed and the lean angle actually results from that. That's the calm curves. Uh, they, they, I suppose they are not the dangerous ones. The dangerous ones are the curves where the speed uh, has to be adjusted to your tolerance to lean angle. And those are the, the, uh, the dangerous ones because if you go into these curves with a, with a excess, not with, excess, with inappropriate speed, actually, we have to ask the questions, what, what, what is inappropriate? But I come back to that on the, on the, on the very next sheet. Um, inappropriate, speed, inappropriate speed might be something different with motorcycles, and we have to consider that, and riders have to know what kinds of speeding are there with motorcycles. It's different than it is for cars. Um, first of all, of course, you can be too fast for the law, and uh, since this is not very interesting, I'd like to uh, use the place here to remind you of Nielsen's power model which is also valid for motorcycles. The further, the faster you go, the, the more it hurts. In this video, and I hope you can hear the sound, this guy was obviously too fast 
for the available friction. And I wouldn't show you that if, if this, he was not hurt actually. He, my, my, my daughter was there and shot the video uh, doing observations for the Austrian Road Safety Board. The guy dropped his, uh, his rear view mirror with her uh, and came back to pick it up half an hour later. Too fast. All along. Look, have a look, have a, have a look at the lean angle of this rider. Hope everybody can see the video. No, it is always difficult with presentations. Look at the lean angle here and compare it with the lean angle of these racing riders on wet surface. It's almost nothing. So this guy definitely was too fast for himself. And practically he was not too fast for Colombo or anything else. He was not exceeding physical limits. He was exceeding his own limit. He thought he was too fast, but he wasn't. So let's continue. Uh, sometimes the road is simply too narrow. Uh, we shot this video actually when we did the, uh, the evaluation of our uh, full floor marking study. Yeah, another case where definitely the person thought I'm too fast. This person was not too fast. If he would have been too fast, he would have fallen, but he did not. So he was too fast for his thinking, actually. You see, uh, thinking about motorcycle crashes is, is something quite particular. Uh, we did a study, actually, a naturalistic study, and we found out that 79% of the riders there, they would have hit the oncoming bus. 16% would even fit it, would have even fit it be, be, be between the A pillars of the bus and only 5%. And that, that what, what was one of, the, one of the better results. We had even worse ones. So two, around two and 3% uh, in other studies, only such a small number is passing this particular curve. And I suppose many others as well. Uh, on a bad trajectory. So um, we need to do something about that. And here's some ideas. We actually used um, the knowledge that motorcycle riders avoid road markings. Simple reason for that in driving school, they learned that road markings are slippery and they should avoid that. So we painted, no, actually we didn't paint, we glued, that is sheet material and it is glued to the floor. We glued um, a sheet material in uh, either bar uh, um, shape or this elliptic uh, uh, version of these uh, road markings to the floor and we observed the trajectories of riders. And as you can see in the pictures, that was a quite successful idea. So we could dramatically re reduce the number of riders on a bad trajectory. Uh, if you remember the previous picture, actually the ones who, who would have hit the bus. Okay, that was once in 2016. It was nine curves. We succeeded in eight ones because one of the roads we, we tried to use was blocked afterwards. And we did another evaluation three years later in 2020. Seven curves of those we have initially painted were left for, uh, uh, for evaluation. And what we actually found is that the elliptic design improves, but the bar design, which did not perform as well uh, in the previous study, catched, uh, could catch up, actually, so they are more or less equally uh, uh, effective for the trajectories. And we also did an initial study on the crashes. So that means we uh, uh, we could reduce from uh, 16 uh, injuries, including one death actually, to seven crashes afterwards, which you all know um, from the scientific point is nice, but not significant. But we also did other things. We exported that. We exported it to Luxembourg uh, which has meanwhile more than 50 curves e equipped with mainly the bar design. And they also have very good, resign, uh, good results uh, concerning the trajectories, as you can see in the graph. And they have meanwhile uh, installed a couple of, uh, and as I suppose uh, the number is still increasing, uh, more routes. And they have definitely solved 
their road safety problem in their curves on the on the particular very nice routes they have uh, in Luxembourg. We also exported. Hey, the sheet doesn't change. Ah, no. Okay, yes, this one. We also exported it to Slovenia with uh, an earlier design, which is not used anymore in Austria. This uh, W-shaped uh, um, uh, road markings, we don't use them anymore in Austria. Nevertheless, they are still effective in uh, Slovenia. And I heard that recently there was a study on that. I don't know the results yet. That was an interesting thing. I mean, in 2019, the, the region of Tyrol, the government there gave me 20, 20, 25,000 euros. And they said, look for your curves and paint them. And that's what I did. I found actually 19 curves and um, went there to paint, to paint the road. And that was not one of the worst ideas we had. Uh, in 2022, um, uh, the Tyrolean government again came and asked me for an update. So um, I took my colleagues from the Austrian Road Safety Board. We went there, we took a lot of pictures, and we looked at the crash numbers in our particular curves. And if we add up all the 19 curves together in the before period, we on average had 6.3 slight injuries, 6.4 severe, and 0.57 fatalities every year. Of course, this period includes the, um, uh, the uh, 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 corona pandemic, so we had to take care of the exposure and we collected uh, exposure data. Uh, the Tyrolean the, the government, they have the finest ex uh, exposure data you can imagine. And we took a, <laughs> a lot of uh, data to find out what we have to, um, uh, um, uh, uh, what we how we have to consider that and we did and in the end we uh, we found two slight injuries and uh, two severe injuries in the after period which means an 80 percent reduction in terms of crashes no fatalities uh, uh, ever since then in the after period unfortunately still not significant but close to significant other countries are running uh, uh, trials uh, as well. So uh, this is one of the um, good ideas. However, there are also other ones concerning infrastructure. So what we uh, remember the statistics from the Austrian in-depth study, we need predictable alignment. We don't need these, as we call them, doggy curves. Uh, is that a correct English term? I don't know. In, in German, they are called Hundskurven, okay? Um, we need predictable friction, of course. We don't need high friction, but it has to be predictable. Uh, for giving roadsides would be nice. In particular, if you look at these chevrons on the picture, they are placed on plastic poles. For a motorcycle rider, it's not so nice if you place one of these chevrons on a steel pole, because this might definitely hurt quite a lot. Um, um, Jenny talked about guardrails as well. We need technical solutions. We need a, a, a solution for retrofitting. That's not so easy. It's quite a difficult task to have a retrofitting solution for uh, guardrails. And we need good solutions for new installations as well. And of course, if we talk about uh, forgiving roadsides, we need to remove each and every guardrail, which is not necessary for the sake of motorcycle safety. And all of that has to be. Uh, or should be actually, because many countries have, but uh, some countries still do not have infrastructure guidelines addressing motorcycle safe road design. I am, I'm sorry, I absolutely uh, found no good transition from the previous to uh, this slide, uh, which has changed the topic. It's about minimum ages. So actually, if you look at uh, all uh, all crashes and all ages in Austria, this is Austrian data, then a moped is a minor issue. But if you go for 15 and 16 year old people, mopeds are killing 82% of the road for the, uh, um, of, of the persons um, uh, which are killed uh, in this age. So this is what you have to know if you about, uh, talk about lowering minimum ages, and that's what we did. What that's what we did in Austria. I can't tell you the whole story uh, 
I don't want to bother you. However, in, in 1979, uh, they thought uh, that lowering the minimum age is a good idea, but we had a lot of conditions for that. I don't want, want to go into details, but that would take me too much. However, in the meantime, in 2009, all these preconditions were removed. And as you can see, by lowering the minimum age from 16 to 15, we added another 2,000 injuries. I think that stands for itself if we talk about lowering minimum ages. And if you, that's me, by, by the way, riding behind mop, moped riders uh, for, uh, for a, a training purpose in a, in a research project. Um, and unhappily, this, uh, this uh, um, a, a, a picture is taken in the autumn season. If, we, if I would take an, have taken one uh, from, the, uh, from the spring season, they would not have worn any uh, protective equipment. So what we actually did, um, what we actually did, was to put uh, AM uh, license holders into an A1 test. You have to know that in Austria, absolutely no test is uh, recommended uh, uh, is required uh, to a, a practical test is required to acquire an AM license. Uh, A1 is the next and. Practically, I mean, if you have a tuned moped driving 80 or a 100, 125 cc driving at 80, it's more or less the same. Uh, in some time, in some cases, even the vehicles are the same, just with a different engine. In 2019, we did the first study. With, we put 85 subjects on a moped and we uh, applied an A1 test. 58% failed. Where the normally prepared A1 candidates, they only failed by two and a half percent. In 23, we uh, repeated that with two additional, uh, with one additional uh, session of uh, uh, guided writing, and the result was even 66% failed. The main reason for that, I mean, in Austria, we have uh, two hours of practical training in traffic only for, uh, uh, for a mobile license required. These young people, they have absolutely no clue how to correctly pass intersections. They have no clue about how to turn. And I mean, speeding, yes, they, they are speeding. They, they are absolutely not interested in 30 kilometer uh, zones uh, or uh, 30 kilometer limits. And in addition, we did an opinion poll. So 90% of the people ask would be in favor of a practical test. So why not doing that? We need a practical test and we need that in Europe. Um, I talked about uh, their um, protective equipment. With protective clothing, we have proceeded pretty well. We have technical standards. They, have, they all came up in the last 10, 15 years. We have legal, no, we don't have legal obligations only for the helmet. Uh, for legal obligation, we would probably need a proof for all purposes. We would need to know which equipment is necessary for what, realistically. However, what we do in Austria, and I suppose in Germany, it's the same. We reduce the compensation for injury by 25% if people have not worn a proper uh, protective equipment. Of course, a lot can be done about motivation. And what we definitely would need is a rating system. I mean, we have Euro NCAP. We test roads. Uh, we test uh, uh, tires. It would be nice to have tests and ratings on protective equipment yes the, the 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 consumers the riders have to they they just have to rely on uh, the recommendation of the dealer of their uh, of their trust and i i, I don't think that uh, this is or or on word of mouth from other riders i don't think this is nice we have uh airbag jackets probably um there should be a little bit more research because we don't have too much. We have a little bit of technical standards. We don't very much about, we hardly know anything about effectiveness. There are only a couple of studies. Uh, my friends, uh, uh, Victoria Gittelman and Shalom Hackett from Technical Uni Technion University, they have studied the study and we have something in the pipeline here asking riders for the experience with and without uh, airbag jackets. So this is going to be my work for the winter season um, uh, this year. Uh, in further, we will need to know uh, 
whether a legal obligation is uh, useful or not. For that, we would have to prove effectiveness, of course. However, we can still motivate and we could have a rating system for that either. Helmets, we have uh, improved quite far uh, with helmets. We have a, log a legal obligation everywhere in Europe. Uh, we have these cases of re reduced compensation in Austria and other countries. I heard about that. Um, but current problem is proper fastening. And addressing that, we need uh, motivation. And also with helmets, we still have no safety rating system. And it would be nice whether to know whether uh, an expensive helmet is also a safe one or a cheaper one is not a, is not a good one. Periodic technical inspection. I know it is well discussed. Just one sentence addressing this. I have powered two wheels for 40 years in the meantime. And it's absolutely normal for me to take them to, uh, to, the, uh, to the mechanic of my trust once a year to have them technically inspected. That's all I want to say. And this takes me already to the last sheet and probably one of the most interesting ones because this is more future uh, oriented than anything else. It's the, the electronic stuff, actually. I don't want to talk about ABS because someone else is going to do that uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes. ISA, quite interesting. We, uh, well, if I go through Switzerland, I always have my uh, speed advice on. My TomTom -tom tells me when I'm too fast because I simply can't afford to pay, uh, um, uh, to pay fines in Switzerland. We have that. It's possible already. Could be on each and every motorcycle. Uh, lane departure warning and adaptive cruise control, they're coming up for the more expensive. They're, they're currently being uh, implemented in the more expensive uh, sector of motorcycles. But that could be in everyone. However, uh, probably adaptive cruise control is more a comfort than uh, a safety issue, although a safe distance to the vehicle in front always interesting. Um, I want to refer what I have recently seen in a demonstration of the Connected uh, uh, Motorcycle Consortium, uh, which was held on um, in Germany at the Lausitzring a, a couple of uh, weeks ago. They have demonstrated they already can avoid a lot of different kinds of collisions. Um, this intersection movement assist is more or less that uh, Motorcycles and cars talk to each other. They tell each other where they are, where they are going, and they decide how to avoid a collision if in case it should be dangerous to collide. We have stationary vehicle warning. That means that cars and motorcycles talk to each other. And if a car is uh, blocked somewhere due to what reason ever, it warns other people, hey, take care, I'm there, I'm standing, uh, and it's it, it's not uh, voluntary. Uh, I, I, I'm broken down or something like that. So these are the things they already can. Electronic emergency brake light. Yes, uh, cars talk to each other and tell each other that they are braking and the, the cars behind already know. Um, so what is here? We also have... Um, uh, individual system is in cars which realize that the, uh, uh, that the motorcycle is going to crash. Uh, and I'd like to finish my presentation now with the fact that this crash here, by the way, filtering in Austria is legal, and that's my motorcycle, and I almost lost my little finger uh, in, the, in this crash. But they have proof that they can avoid a crash like that. So that is real crash reduction, and I suppose that there's also a lot in implementing these electronic systems. And that's my, uh, that's, that's my prognosis about the future of motorcycle safety. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, uh, this insightful presentation. You appealed to uh, many of our prejudices on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, with, with, with your slides. And actually, the last slide also um, answered one uh, of the um, questions that had been uh, uh, just asked on uh, the um, Q&A. Uh, now, uh, without further ado, we uh, move to uh, Jessica Trong from uh, uh, Towards Zero Foundation. Uh, TFZ have been uh, uh, very active in Europe and in the rest of the world uh, uh, on uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, motorcycle um, ABS. 
and uh, uh, we are uh, delighted to hear more about this campaign and these activities uh, uh, directly from uh, Jessica. Thank you so much, Antonio, and good morning to everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity from ETSC to be able to share some of the work that we're doing at the Transport uh, the Towards Zero Foundation on the topic of um, motorcycle ABS. So I'm just checking everyone can see my slides. Uh, yes, we can. Fantastic. Excellent. So. My name is Jessica and I'm the Secretary General of the Towards Zero Foundation and we've been uh, very interested in looking at ways to increase motorcycle safety as we know that they're extremely vulnerable which I'm sure the previous two speakers have already covered off and there are unfortunately few initiatives and solutions that can keep them safe at this point in time but one of those very effective solutions that is available to us at the moment is motorcycle ABS. And at the Towards Zero Foundation, we've got a project called the Stop the Crash Partnership, where we've been promoting some of the most life-saving crash avoidance technologies. Some of them are focused on passenger vehicles, and another one is motorcycle ABS, which is very much about increasing motorcycle safety. And we started this initiative in 2015. So it's been a number of years now, and we've sort of been all around the world promoting these uh, for technologies. Um, and these are some of the events that we've held. We've, you know, we started off in Brazil, we've been, we've covered Latin America, we've been to Southeast Asia, China, um, India, in America, um, South Africa as well. Um, but what we've realized is we need to really, if we want to sort of make a difference with motorcycle ABS, we sort of need to concentrate on the regions of the world where we're seeing a huge demand for motorcycle usage and unfortunately also a corresponding high number of fatalities and injuries. And the region that we selected for our focused motorcycle ABS initiative is the ASEAN region in Southeast Asia. And one of the reasons why we're focusing on the ASEAN region is, you know, more than 60-70% of their usage, uh, transport usage, is on motorcycles. In some countries such as Vietnam, up to 90% of um, their usage is on motorcycles. And unfortunately, they've got a correspondingly high number of FSIs. And as you can see from this slide here, um, unfortunately, most of the countries in the ASEAN region also haven't implemented uh, the very basic recommended UN standards to improve vehicle safety and motorcycle safety. And in that very last column there, you can see there's a regulation for motorcycle ABS and only Malaysia and Thailand out of the 10 ASEAN countries at this point in time have uh, regulated for this technology and Thailand's regulation which actually start to come into play next year. Uh, now, this is a bit of an old slide, as you can see, it's from 2017, but I just wanted to use it to highlight some of the countries that have already implemented a motorcycle ABS legislation um, and some that are thinking of it. Some of this, of course, is now old, such as Australia, which has the ABS regulation in place already. But I wanted to highlight how many of these regulations are focusing on larger capacity motorcycles. Uh, you can see for the EU, you know, we've sort of um, mandated ABS for motorcycles that are of 125cc and above. And that's quite typical in a lot of the regulations that we're seeing around the world. It's generally for the larger capacity bikes. Um, but, you know, if we take a deeper look into the actual motorcycle usage in different regions, especially in Southeast Asia, most of the bikes being used are of a much lower capacity, meaning even if we do put in place a motorcycle ABS regulation, it may not affect the vast majority of the bikes that are being used by the population. So when we first started this initiative a couple of years ago to focus on the ASEAN market to um, encourage them to adopt motorcycle ABS, we commissioned a report to actually look at the status of motorcycle safety in the ASEAN region, look at the penetration rate of motorcycle ABS, and also the types of bikes that the different countries are using. 
And some of the key findings from this status report was that small engine capacity bikes dominate the market in most of the ASEAN countries. And as of right now, very few of the motorcycles that are being sold into the region are actually equipped with ABS. And if they are equipped with ABS for sale, they're once again only available on the larger capacity motorcycles. Um, so sort of highlighting what I said earlier, smaller engine capacity bikes make up 90% of the total number of motorcycles in uh, Malaysia, 80% in Thailand and 90% in Indonesia. So, you know, in pushing for regulations in these regions, we really have to reconsider at what capacity we should putting that, be putting that regulation at. Um, um, and one of the ways we can effectively do that is not focus on the capacity of the bike maybe, but stipulate that any power two-wheeler that's capable of a travel speed of 50 kilometres or greater should be equipped with this technology because I guess it doesn't really matter if you're coming off the bike at 50 kilometres or more, whether you're on a big bike or a small bike, it's going to hurt equally as much. So um, one of the ways we thought it would be easier is for, to actually say, let's just concentrate on the speed of the bike but also understanding there may be difficulties for some regions who sort of aren't able to specify in their regulations of speed. So an alternative is actually to actually specify the regulation for any, um, for 50 cc or above, which would cover the majority of the market and ensure the lower capacity bikes also have this important technology. And one of the key findings that we found out of this status report was just by implementing motorcycle ABS in the region, we will be able to save lives of up to 8,000 motorcyclists every year. So that's a significant number of lives that we can save just by implementing and regulating for one technology. And that's one of the reasons why we're pushing so hard for the region to consider this technology as um, as a mandatory feature as soon as possible. And fortunately, we've got lots of partners, um, including ETSC, both locally in ASEAN and also globally, that are very interested in helping push this mandate forward in the ASEAN region. And as a result of that, we decided to form a motorcycle ABS partnership. And the aim of the partnership is to increase the fitment rate of motorcycle ABS in the ASEAN region and to increase consumer demand on this life-saving feature. And the second objective of this partnership is to encourage the region-wide commitment to mandate for motorcycle ABS for any power two-wheeler that is capable of a travel speed of 50 or more. So at the end of this campaign and this, um, this project, we're hoping that every single country in ASEAN will have this regulation. And even better, if they can mandate it as a block, it would um, eliminate some of the issues regarding supply as well. Um, so currently we have 17 partners on board. A number of partners are located in the ASEAN region, including our really good partners in ASEAN ANCAP, AIP Foundation, the Asian Development Bank, but we also have a number of global partners such as ETSC, Limbo Philanthropies and the FIA Foundation that are located um, you know, outside of the region. And you know, one of the aims of this campaign is of course to secure the region-wide mandate. And what we've been doing is we've been trying to hold live demonstrations in conjunction with um, ministerial events that are taking place in the region one, to raise the awareness around this life-saving technology to the ministers, but two, also demonstrate to them in a live fashion how exactly this technology works. And we find that these live demonstrations are a very powerful way to show people why this technology works and why it works so well. So in the last year, we've um, attended, well, we didn't attend, but in conjunction with the 28th ASEAN Transport Ministers meeting, we held a live demonstration um, um, outside of their event and they were able to come and have a look. And we also submitted a memorandum highlighting the key facts around motorcycle ABS and the reasons why they should be mandating the technology as a block. Um, this was a part of that event that was held last year in Bali. You can see we had quite a number of stakeholders there. And this was the live demonstration of the technology. Um, in conjunction with the ATM ministers meeting that's gonna be held 
next year, we hope to run a similar event as well. Once again, we want to keep that uh, focus on the technology and keep it on the agenda until the time that it actually is in a part of the regulation. And this is the um, this is the endorsement that we're hoping to achieve from them, which is very similar to our campaign objective. Um, and lastly, one of the activities that we've got on is, of course, we want to raise awareness of the technology and we want to be able to run these advocacy campaigns. But one of the questions that countries often come to us is, OK, we're, we want to mandate and we want to put in place a regulation. What do we do? How do we do it? How do we put it through our system? Uh, what are the steps? So understanding that countries are actually asking for technical uh, support in implementing this regulation, uh, we actually submitted a application to the UN Road Safety Fund to seek some funding to develop some technical recommendations and guidance for countries on how they can apply the UN regulation for motorcycle APS. So the partners that are involved in this project include UNSCAT, the uh, regional UN body in the ASEAN region, UNECE, who develops all the technical regulations uh, on vehicles, the FIA Foundation, our local partner in Malaysia, Myros, and of course, uh, there's ourselves. And we're hoping in the next year, this draft recommendation and guidance and roadmap will be available and we'll be able to share this with the uh, with the countries in the region and hopefully, once again, give them another push to implement this important regulation. So we've got a number of activities coming up in the next year, uh, all focused on the ASEAN region, and it's all um, around the same types of activities and we're not letting up until we get the project outcomes that we're hoping for. So if there are any partners on this call that are interested in actually joining us on this campaign, please feel free to reach out. And the Motorcycle ABS report is um, available on our website if you want to read through any of the details in terms of what's actually happening in the ASEAN region. So you're very um, welcome to that information. So yeah, thank you for your time today. And I hope this gives you a glimpse of the work that we're trying to do. And if there's any support that you're able to lend us, we would help happily welcome them as well. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Actually, uh, uh, well, we have to know that Jessica was in the middle of uh, a board meeting of the organization. So uh, we are extremely uh, happy that uh, you managed to pose that and uh, um, come and speak to us. Unfortunately, because of this very reason, uh, she will not be able to stay on. But uh, 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 let me thank you once again and uh, um, get a, a round of applause from our uh, virtual uh, round of applause from uh, uh, all the people who are in this call. So thank you very much and uh, uh, do keep up the great work on uh, um, ABS and uh, um, your um, action. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Jessica. Uh, um, I uh, would now uh, like to have uh, uh, brought up uh, at the same time Jenny and uh, Martin. We have uh, a, a Q&A um, session. Uh, um, certainly, uh, the safety of uh, motorcycle users is uh, uh, um, having a lot of attention and a lot of interest from uh, uh, our uh, participants. We have uh, um, received quite a few questions, and uh, I'm afraid we will not be able to answer all of them. Uh, we will certainly make a selection, and then we will aim to um, give uh, in one way or uh, another an answer to those uh, uh, that will not be um, answered uh, live. I need to look at my mobile because this is the way uh, I um, get them selected from uh, uh, my uh, colleagues. So, uh, well, the first one is uh, uh, actually, Jenny, I'll ask it to you. And uh, um, it's about the PIN uh, uh, report uh, about power to wheelers. Of course, we saw uh, the data uh, and uh, uh, how different countries perform in uh, uh, improving uh, the safety of power to wheelers. Uh, uh, something that uh, is being asked is uh, um, about some best practices uh, from uh, 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 the different countries when it comes to uh, improving to uh, the safety of uh, uh, motorcycle users. So where should we look at if we want to have good practices? Thanks. So, um, yeah, so we, we got within our report, we got some uh, stories of good practice stories um, from across the PIN countries. And it's really 
you know, some it's not one person that's really got it 100% correct. And it's obviously important to say that if you have high levels of overall road safety, then you tend to also have a uh, high road safety for your power two wheeler uh, users. But we have some examples in our report. So we have um, we have some examples from Switzerland. Switzerland has extremely high um, helmet wearing rates, which is something that can perhaps be looked to. How did they achieve that? Uh, we have examples from Austria. We just heard from Martin about the work they've been doing there um, in reducing uh, curves. Um, I learned about a project in Scotland yesterday, also um, a similar sort of project, helping um, power two wheelers take the safest um, line, let's say, in a corner. Um, so there's lots of lots of different aspects that can be uh, addressed, and uh, we have examples of them in our report. So take a look. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, um, I have a question from uh, um, Hank Slipdunk. Uh, he's uh, uh, one of the PIN co-chairs, so of course he gets fast-tracked when it comes to the questions. Uh, and it's about uh, 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 crashes on uh, straight road sections. Uh, you can have crashes, he says, resulting from, uh, I'm learning a new word here, shimmying, uh, a mechanical instability of the front wheel. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, technically it's probably not that interesting. I mean, there are two kinds uh, of technical instability. It's the it, it's the high high speed uh, thing, and it's the the wobbling at lower speeds. However, uh, if you, <laughs> I have I have just started uh, something to find out what actually the 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 crashes on straight roads are because we have that as the most frequent single uh, crash cause uh, in Austria as well. It's it's narrow margin uh, next to curves, but it's the most frequent one. And if you ask me, I think that most of the crashes on straight roads, they loom in curves. It's just the output of a person with an oncoming car managing to avoid the oncoming car then falling due to a lack of uh, um, uh, roll angle tolerance and dropping the bike actually on, on the next straight line. So I think that most reasons for um, for crashes on straight roads are the, the curve behind you. Thank you uh, very much, Martin. I had seen a question to Jenny, which I'm looking for on my screen. There it is. Uh, um, so, uh, do we have any explanation for uh, the high number of women dying on motorcycles and mopeds in uh, Denmark and Norway? Tough question. Tough question. <laughs> yeah, it's not, um, I should first say, it's not something we um, looked into, we delved into, but um, I think there's two points that can perhaps be made about um, those countries, maybe even three. So the numbers, first of all, the numbers are very small. They're not quite less than 10, but they really um, are very small. So that will um, play uh, a part, I should think, in, in the proportions. Um, also, we didn't look at the exposure data. Um, you know, maybe there are more female cyclists in those countries. I don't know. Um, they also are countries which have very uh, high levels of overall road safety. So that could also play uh, a role, I suppose, in the behavior of um, power two wheeler riders and, and present those uh, very different um, proportions um, that we saw in the graph. They'd, those would be my three points, but I, as I say, we didn't look into it directly, so I can't give a scientific explanation for it. Maybe more general question to uh, to Martin. Actually, uh, we we saw in our report that uh, uh, nine out of ten uh, uh, persons dying on uh, uh, um, power to wheeler collisions are uh, male. So, is it just a matter of exposure, or is there else some is there also something else that could uh, at least partially explain that? Well, it's a bit of both, I, I would say. Uh, and if I say both, then on the one hand, oh, for sure, it's exposure. I mean, if you go to the, the nice routes, um, uh, if you stop on a, on a pass road with a nice view, you mainly see male faces. That's the one thing. So I suppose exposure has a huge impact. 
but on the other hand, we have to confess, uh, Antonio and me, that risk taking is also male. So uh, probably, uh, if they if they uh, ride, they ride uh, uh, women ride a bit more carefully. Yeah, and, and related to that, actually, I'm turning 50 soon and I'm male and I didn't have a motorbike before. Is it time I buy a powerful one? <laughs> Antonio, probably you, you start with a moped. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have to confess I'm in favor of, uh, of um, a graduate approach. So um, use your bike in urban area. The bicycle, then go for a moped, probably then a hundred and twenty-five cc, and that will do if you move in Brussels. What about refresher courses? Because we saw that big rise in the midlifers uh, being killed. Um, it's perhaps that they got their license when they were younger. They take it up again when they are older. Um, is there a role for refresher courses? Maybe when people are buying the bigger bicycle. Um, I think maybe there's a role there as well in in for the in terms of training and the skills. Uh, indeed, Jenny, um, I, I would support that. I, I, I have to repeat that a graduate access, I, I mean, we have to say that heavy machines are not dangerous. The dangerous on a motorcycle is the upper part. And uh, if if you have uh, well, of course we have more crashes on uh, on um, heavier motorcycles, but I suppose that the reason is not that these vehicles uh, with more power are more dangerous, but it's the people buying and riding them. And of course, it's a matter of uh, exposure. I mean, the I can tell you numbers from Austria. I, we know that the average motorcycle goes to. 1,956 kilometers a year. With the heavier ones, we have about 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers a year. That's much more, of course. So it's also a question of exposure. Martin, uh, you are asked to elaborate a bit more on uh, lane sharing and uh, uh, filtering. Uh, is, it is said in the question that uh, uh, there are countries in the EU where uh, uh, this is allowed, where it's not allowed, where, where it's encouraged. So uh, um, can you elaborate on that? You've mentioned it towards the end of the presentation, but if uh, um, you could say a few uh, words more. Yes, there's a couple of studies on that, but uh, none of them really succeeded. I mean, we have a, a study in, the, in Belgium, I suppose, where uh, filtering is legal on a highway, uh, at the maximum speed of 50 kilometers or something. Uh, don't kill me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's around 50. Um, um, and they, they, they could not find uh, additional uh, crashes for that. Austria actually, I suppose, is the only place in the world where filtering in urban areas is legal in order to, to get to the next traffic light and stop there ahead. We even uh, create spaces for bicycles and motorcycles ahead of the normal stop line. Uh, to 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 stop there and and get out first we can't we can't find these crashes uh in in the crash record so um i suppose if you do that um using your brain properly it's not as dangerous as you probably would expect it Thank you. Um, yes, uh, one on uh, um, ABS, uh, again, that uh, uh, appreciates the work that has been uh, uh, done, it is being done by uh, the Towards Zero Foundation, but also wonders about the situation in uh, uh, the um, European Union. Well, we know that uh, uh, at the moment, uh, anti-lock braking systems are mandatory for uh, uh, vehicles above uh, 125 cc's, uh, they are uh, they could be um, installed as an alternative uh, to combined braking systems for anything that is below 125. Uh, Martin, uh, uh, what's your opinion on that? Should we have it for anything that is above uh, 50 uh, cc or anything that goes above 50 kilometers an hour? I think uh, ABS is actually something. Uh, that any rider uh, would benefit from, regardless which vehicle. And um, I would also be in favor um, of uh, ABS on electric bicycles. 
And uh, we have tested that at the Austrian uh, Road Safety Board. You are warmly welcome to visit our um, to visit our website and have a look. Uh, you can also find that on YouTube. Just uh, look for ABS and Austrian Road Safety Board and bicycle, electric bicycle. You're gonna find the film, uh, and you're also gonna find a very nice stuntman doing all these rides. Um, however, I'm strongly in favor, even with uh, with electric bicycles. And I would warmly recommend anyone. I mean, uh, the return on the on investment is on the very first crash. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, uh, Jenny, uh, there is a question uh, for you linked to uh, EU policy work. Um, helmet wearing rates are um, on average very high. Uh, um, but, however, it is still an issue in some European countries. Uh, do you think that the introduction of KPI, Key Performance Indicator, uh, will help in uh, um, targeting this issue? Yes, I mean, we saw, we gathered the helmet wearing rates from the pin countries that could provide it, and we can see it in our um, report that some are very high. I mentioned Switzerland already, very high rates. Um, other countries um, have some way to go. I think a KPI is not going to solve, you know, um, all, all power two-wheeler um, road safety problems, but it's definitely, a, you know, it gives you a point in the sand and it gives you a moment from which you can um, hopefully only improve and it um, allows you to measure the, um, the impact of your, uh, the, the measures that you do take. Um, and so we would always um, encourage people to um, use KPIs to measure, to measure progress and to sort of as a driver to, to, to make improvement. Um, Martin, something on uh, um, electric power two-wheelers, uh, uh, should they be included in the range of mopeds or uh, motor rollers? I think maybe it was meant motorcycles here. Oh, um, um, uh, to be honest, I, I don't really get the point. What, what is the difference? I mean, uh, you can power anything electric. Uh, you can have an electric motorcycle with, uh, if we compare that <laughs> with a hundred horsepower or more, it, it's just a matter of the size of the battery, how far you can go with a with a bike like that, and and uh, how you operate actually the accelerator. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I think what uh, this question probably is about is these electric scooters, these uh, twenty five uh, kilometers an hour scooters which don't need a driving uh, license, which don't need a license plate either. Um, no need for helmets and all of that stuff. Well, we know that uh, this is uh, an upcoming problem, uh, an upcoming serious problem. And you, you find these people uh, everywhere on every road. Um, they are used uh, quite frequently for delivery purposes. Uh, for both food and uh, non-food uh, delivery. Uh, I think that our systems of, um, of um, collecting accident data are not yet prepared for this kind of, for this kind of vehicle. So in Austria, we still have the problem that we do not have very much experience because we can't, can't identify, well, in the meantime, we can identify them in the crash work record, but we do, we have no data to compare. So this is an upcoming problem. We should have an eye on, uh, and as soon as we have data, I could answer the question probably. Thank you. And the last question for you, uh, Martin, then we'll break. It's uh, mm. a bit more technical. Is there any research on uh, technologies like the ESP that uh, could adjust the speed according to the lean angle? Well, in terms of motorcycles, it's quite difficult to adjust the speed by the bike because if you're in a roll angle position, uh, there is a a strict mathematical relation between speed and the lean angle uh, and the radius you're riding. So uh, anything that happens during the curve is, I suppose, probably too late. ESP, there is um, a master thesis by a German colleague, uh, 
it's definitely not possible to do it the same way as you do it with cars. They had, um, believe me or not, they have tried to put rockets on the rear wheel uh, to to push them uh, to the floor uh, in case the, the, the rear wheel starts skidding. That is technically possible. It can be done, but it did not uh, uh, get from uh, from uh, research uh, to, to to the field. And I, I mean, you we really not really need a lot of stuff to do that. So technically, we have some initial solutions. Uh, practically, it is quite difficult. Uh, believe me, I, I mean, as I told you, speed is also a very personal thing because it is affected by your personal your personal speed limit it's your roll angle tolerance which limits the speed you can you can ride so what a system like that would have to do is to get to know you it would need to know in which mood you are uh what is your current and your uh your your, uh, your mood of the day and your um state of health, whatever, it need to know what is your current uh, um, roll angle tolerance and would have to warn you in advice. I know there is an app uh, developed, uh, a, a smartphone app developed by an Austrian startup, and they try uh, to warn with a, with, a, um, with a bracelet that is vibrating. My first test rides, I suppose uh, this system did not get to know me really. I didn't drive enough, but probably sooner or later we will have uh, simple solutions which uh, which provide uh, reliable and suitable warnings. If you approach a curve uh, with a speed that is normally not within your range. But it's much difficult, much more difficult than it is for cars, of course. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Thank you, uh, Jenny. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Where to live? Uh, we uh, now have uh, a little break. We'll uh, resume promptly at uh, uh, eleven thirty-five with uh, uh, two uh, more um, interesting uh, uh, presentations. Thank you very much. See you in uh, thirteen minutes. Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, um, 11.35, ready to go again with uh, um, two uh, very interesting presentations. We start with the um, German Road Safety Council, DBR, um, K. Schulte on the European Training Quality Label. Uh, that is uh, a voluntary certification scheme for uh, uh, post-license uh, safety training programs, uh, which is uh, um, run by the German Road Safety Council, uh, the international uh, uh, Motorcycle Federation, FIM, and uh, ASEM, the European Association of uh, uh, Motorcycle uh, Manufacturers. Kai, over to you. Thank you very much, Antonio. So I will share my presentation in a moment. I hope that everything is working. So do you see everything? No? Man, fantastic. Okay. Oh, yeah. seen it. okay. So, thank you very much. Yes, I want to talk about the European Training Quality Label from this year of three organizations. And I think it's, um, it is a wonderful thing that we must promote it to whole Europe or around the whole world. Um, but give me, give me some ideas. So, the German Road Safety Council has since October 2007, for all his road safety activities, a clear strategy, and this is a Vision Zero strategy. And Vision Zero is based on four fundamental principles. You can see it there. So the human beings are failable. We know this. So we make mistakes, and I'm, I can promise you, we will make also mistakes in the future. This is normal for <clears throat> humans, and this must be also normal for humans because you can learn also from mistakes. But the tolerable limits are set by the physical endurance from the body. And there's a one main principle. We are not talking about life. Life is not negotiable. We have no, no chance. And we have to do everything that mistakes must not be punished with death or serious injuries. This is our task. And for this, we have um, in <clears throat> our working area, 
So my working area especially is prevention of work-related road accidents. And there we have a clear, nice model. So when we are talking about measures or measurements, we use this STOP model, S plus TOP. So this means think about, if you want to change a system, think about the technical aspects, think about the situational aspects, if it's possible, think about organizational aspects. This means, for example, working conditions. So working times is something like this. So can you change something there uh, that the employees can manage their ways in a more safer way? And last but not least, think about the person, the individual factors you can influence. And when we are talking about riding a motorcycle, I think you can do a lot on the area of the technical part. So Martin was giving some examples, for example, these road markings in a curve. This is a technical aspect. ABS is a technical aspect for a motorbike. So you can do a lot of things on the technical part. But as Martin also said, not the motorcycle is the dangerous kind of riding a bike, it is the driver. This is the most responsible part using a motorbike. And you can do something of this technical area, but not everything. So on the other side, um, we must think about the person. So using a motorbike means directly think about the person who is riding a motorbike in, in all different aspects. So what is important? What can we do? How can we influence this person? How can we bring the right ideas of safe riding into the mind of this person? And I think you know the GDE matrix. I take the GDE matrix from 2010. So you have this five levels, call them five levels. So level one and two, we call it more, it's the technical competence of driving. So the basic vehicle control, mastering of traffic situations. The level three and four, this is more the social competence of driving. So driving motives, purposes, goals of life, attitudes, this is a social aspect. And then we have level five, since 2010, this cultural social background. It's also influencing my kind of driving style, how to use a motorbike, how to think about traffic, what's happened there. And the General Safety Council translated this matrix in the field of driver education. I don't know if you know the Road User Education Project. So there is a description for a curriculum how to use this matrix in the field of driver education. And I show you the other picture. This means it is more a circle model. So you have these five aspects and you have this person who is riding a motorbike in the traffic, for example. And you see these five aspects. Um, they are all influencing the situation in which you are. So it means driving a curve can be on, done by in a very, very safe way. It can be done also in a very unsafe way. And I was thankful for the examples from Martin. He shows us some interesting videos. So what's happened there with driver not to use the right speeds, the safe speed. So. We seem to have lost Kai. When I'm thinking about basic vehicle control and mastering of traffic situations, <clears throat> I have these other three aspects which are influencing my behavior. So, for example, if I have the wrong, the wrong goal in my mind, I'm the best rider in the world, I can manage every situation, then it can be that on the way of basic vehicle control, I really will be too fast because I like speed up every time, or oh, I'm very emotional. Um, I can give you another, another example, for example, driving motives. If you are, we are talking about young people or for also this, this class AM, so these mopeds, um, you have mostly three different driving styles uh, when I'm talking about young people. So in the morning when they're going to school, it can be, that they are a little bit in a hurry yeah, to be on the right time in school. 
uh, on midday, they use their motorbike, for example, as a pizza, pizza taxi. So it's a completely different motivation. So they speed up to be very fast to earn money. And in the evening, they want to go to a nice rendezvous with a nice girl or something like this. Then they have a different motivation to, draw, to ride this motorbike. And motives are very influencing a lot of behavior of people who are riding a motorbike. And the same is goals in life or attitudes. So if you have this think in your mind, the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. It's completely different when you're thinking about the driving style. So sometimes when the glass is half empty, it can be very, very dangerous. When you're thinking the glass is half full, so mm, be smart, smooth. It's a nice, nice way of riding a bike. And then the last aspect is this culture background. And when we are talking about prevention, it must be very important to, to think what is the social or the culture background. So is there something in a understanding in a different way from, from other parts of, of the world than now in the middle of Europe? And the same can be on the other side. So if you be in a training area, for example, and you learn something about basic vehicle control to have more control with your motorbike in different speeds, it can change also your motives. It can change it or can say something, oh, I'm right, I'm very fantastic. I can use the brake in a very fantastic way. So everything is good. I have ABS, nothing can happen. Yeah? So it can change also the mind how to use a motorbike. So what does it mean for prevention and especially for this European <clears throat> training quality label? Now we have here one picture. It is more related to German traffic, how to use a motorbike. But I give you another example. And it was fantastic to give, to have some, some, some data from Asia. This is a totally different traffic. This is Bangkok. It's completely different. And you must come to now. So what's happened there? You see it on the closes. You see it on how, how um, that there's no really an, 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 um, an distance between the motorbikes. It's completely different. But you must have this idea. So what's, what is behind there? What is the culture background? And how can I influence this kind of behavior with, for example, good measures? And for this, we offered together <clears throat> Uh, with Asim and FIM, and this is, I'm very thankful for this. We offered this European quality label for motorcycle safety to give people a right idea about approved and controlled trainings. And I think this is very important to give users the possibility, okay, now I will join a training session, which is really for high quality, where I can learn a lot of new things to be very safe in traffic. So why we have done this? We know over whole Europe, there are a lot of very good, high quality training, training regimes. They're existing. But also we have some trainings which can be very counterproductive because the trainers will not order. Exercises are not the right way to produce safe motorbike riders. Some trainings produce more risky drivers to speed up, to give them the idea you have, you, you have every time you have the control of your motorbike. And this can be very, very dangerous. So one of the tag of this European training quality label is to have a look into the training concept. So what they are doing there from the didactic, from the pedagogical idea, is it the right way to talk about safe riding a motorbike or unsafe? This is one aspect. And the second aspect is, what are the trainers doing in the training? So you can have a fantastic concept, but you have the wrong trainer for a fantastic concept. So the trainer can destroy everything. Yeah? It's a personal thing. So we must have a look to this. So what, <clears throat> what have we done with this quality label? We said as we have some practical trainings 
directly only on a track-based area. But we have also trainings which will be offered on public roads. Very fantastic. No, on public roads with a motorbike, so you can get really good, safe ideas directly in the traffic. We have trainings, combined trainings in Europe, which combine the track-based area with <clears throat> the road area. And nowadays we have also some trainings which use simulators. So what we are doing in this point, the quality level guarantees that the contents of the training are really good related to the use methodologies. So that everything is working in a good way. And we want to be sure that the quality assurance is really the best way. So we look at this, the trainings on the whole range, what's offered there, the didactic, are these the right exercises, the right communication, uh, the right questions we ask to the drivers, the right motivation, is this the right idea, what is, is the safe kind of using a motorbike? And then we look how the pedagogical method which they use, is it the right method to reach these goals we were defined? And on a second way, we were looking to the initial qualification of the trainers, and we will have a look to the education and further education of the trainers. This is very important. So what I said, you can write down fantastic goals, but if the trainers have the wrong education, they can destroy every goal which we have written down. So this must be really come together in a very, very good way. For this, we are looking uh, directly when <clears throat> training um, sometimes our trainees get this European training quality label. On the other side, we can also have a look to optional models. So some people have an idea to put some, some more contents into a training part. Uh, for example, in Germany, we have some, some companies, they want to have uh, special aspects. For example, um, to use motorbikes, electrical motorbikes in a very fantastic way to have more range or to use a motorbike specially in the changing time between daytime and nighttime because there are a lot of animals so to think about directly of these situations. These are optional models and you can put it also in the training so that we were looking is everything good. And <clears throat> on the second part, we can also have a look to the training premises, uh, premise, premises, so the tracks, the tracks. What's happened there? Are the tracks are really good? Are they defined to, to, to ex, uh, for, for, are they really good for these planned exercises which we want to train with our participants? Last but not least, we can say, this European training quality label is uh, under thinking about the vision zero means that this is a quality sign for a life without fatalities or serious injuries. And this message we want to give to all participants or to all users from motorbikes, think about your personal way of riding and we offer you good trainings who or which can reach these goals to get really good ideas how to save in a very or how to write in a very safe way. I think this is the main topic and thank you very much for this to present this wonderful European training quality label. Thank you very much to you, um, Kai, for uh, uh, this presentation. Already I see some uh, um, questions emerging uh, following uh, uh, your slides, which will be uh, addressed uh, later during the um, Q&A question. Now, uh, Jesper Christensen from uh, FIM, the uh, International Federation of Motorcycling, of course, 
how could we do uh, motorcycle safety without the riders? So uh, that's uh, your opportunity now. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm speaking uh, from the office we have in, uh, in Stockholm. I'm just like Martin, I would like to start with saying that motorcycling is, is extremely uh, enjoyful. What you see here is the former transport minister uh, from Sweden, which I had for a ride. And you can see she looks quite happy about being on a motorcycle. We can go to the next slide. So what I will speak about here is uh, some of the things you heard about already. Uh, it's about the, uh, I would call it the technological revolution in motorcycle safety coming from the Connected Motorcycle Consortium. I will uh, give you some feedback on uh, ABS, which we, we studied. Uh, and then, because it's close to Christmas, I would introduce you to the wish list from the motorcycle riders. And to be polite, also, uh, I would like to, to tell you that the FIM, uh, the Federation of International Motorcycle, uh, we are the governing body for motorcycle sport. And we also consider ourselves to be the global advocate for motorcycling. And within the FIM, I'm responsible director for uh, the uh, Commission of Mobility. So now uh, this is the base for, for what I will speak about. You already uh, saw and, and listened to, uh, to uh, Martin, who was, I, I could hear between the line, quite impressed about uh, what will happen within technology. So the important part to know is that basically all motorcycle manufacturers and so even the car industry uh, are working together to bring the new technology and make it compatible so it will work uh, the, in, in the whole flow uh, of vehicles out on the streets. And to put it extremely simple, uh, what will come uh, is that that 50% of the fatalities we see in, 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 in a very wide scale is with collisions with other vehicles and other vehicles are primary a four wheel passenger car. So we will be able to avoid a number of all these accidents. So this is looking extremely promising. Then you may say that we know in, in even in some of the European countries, we are having uh, up to 70, 75% of the motorcycles on the streets are more than 10 years old. However, there will be options released which can be retrofitted for, I'm very sure, a reasonable price. So, our opinion is that what is being created now is a product which are so sexy and attractive that the motorcycle riders or the users will say, I would like to have such one because it is a good feature for me being a person. And I think this is what we have to learn within uh, road safety is we have to make products that are so good that the users are asking for them. And let this be the word about uh, this fantastic work, uh, revolutionary work, because all stakeholders, competitors are working together. This is really great. So we can go to the next slide. And I will then... Uh, enter the, the world of uh, ABS and what happened uh, with, with the, the implementation of ABS. I would like to start in this way that what we did was we looked a lot at ABS and then we said, well, let's test it. And we did some really serious testing and we translated the test 
not into racing situations where everything is, is very prepared, you train a lot, but we took it out on the street, normal life on the street for the riders. And then we started to explain for the riders in Sweden, uh, what are the benefits, how is it working, how is the pricing, how is maintenance, etc. And what we had was before European Union decided to make ABS mandatory in Europe, we could see that 93% of the Swedish riders were all saying that my next motorcycle should have ABS. So I think the learning lesson we did was that we need to have the citizens organizations, the motorcycle organizations, we need to give them information, possibility to test, etc. Then we will have a much easier situation. The customers will ask the manufacturers for certain products, and it's easier to be a manufacturer when you know what I will do now, it will sell. So I think this is a learning lesson we should bring with us. However, what we did was we uh, asked some of the uh, absolutely leading researchers in motorcycling uh, to make a study where we would like to speak with the riders who had an accident. So we can take the next picture. And what we did was we went out uh, internationally. So we were out in a number of uh, languages. I think we had eight different languages. We did it 2019. We had uh, 1,578 uh, riders from 30 countries. They uh, replied the, the uh, questionnaire we, uh, we had. And Again, we would like to find out uh, how is the rider's uh, perspective uh, when they crash and, and what happens after. Um, we can take the next slide. And there is a lot of text here, uh, but we can sum it up uh, like the accidents uh, there was a question about female riders, and here you will see they made up 8%. Uh, so it's, it's a minority sort of saying. Uh, we had 84% of the riders were living in uh, Europe, uh, and that's what we speak about today. Um, motorcycles were 90%, so there was a few scooters and mopeds. Um, and you will see we are talking about uh, the, the bigger motorcycles. So we can take the next slide. And this is uh, stipulating a little also what we saw uh, earlier today when we asked about speed, uh, that Motorcycle accidents, you often think that they are happening in, in, in quite high speed. Uh, but you can see here, we, we have a median speed between 30 to 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, and we had uh, the, the, uh, the higher percentage was 80 kilometers an hour. So we can take the next one. And here it's getting uh, interesting. You will see a lot of, uh, what do you say, numbers and, and columns here. But the basic uh, part in this, uh, what, what we are looking at here uh, is if you had ABS or not. And you will see here that close to half of the riders had uh, ABS. Next in this, if we go to the, uh, to the next block of data, no, uh, not the next slide. So there you will see prior to crashing, did you apply the brakes? And what we see here is that 
35% uh, did not apply the brakes. So this is a, a very interesting finding, which really never came up to the surface. But in these uh, number of accidents, the riders themselves were saying, no, I did not break. And all this are, in, in our opinion, related to, to um, your normal survival instincts. You freeze, you get scared, you do not know to handle the situation. So then we are back again to one of the uh, core things about making very good training. And then we have the, uh, the, um, the quality uh, label of training, which we, uh, we had. And here, of course, breaking is, is a natural part of this. Uh, we can go, we also looked into if there was a clear sign uh, about training, uh, and here I mean not training for driving license, but post license training. Uh, and you can see down here that um, the highest proportion of motorcyclists who had completed the uh, post license training uh, for emergency braking, and that was 36%. Um, and of those, then we had just below half uh, had bikes with ABS. So training and braking is very important. Let's go to the next slide. And here is again uh, more uh, numbers and, and you can see the split who it, it was uh, if the rider applied bikes. Uh, before or after the uh, the press. And you will actually see that the riders having bikes without ABS, they were more brave and dared to, uh, to apply their brakes. And maybe it's because that they have been riders a longer time using the older bikes. Let's go to the next one. Uh, what we also find in this was that what we call a top side uh, collision uh, that happened in 63% of the cases when you collide with a car. And these uh, gave, uh, what do you say, more uh, severe injuries. Uh, I will not go into details here. We can take the next one. And then we go directly on the uh, summary. At the time when we uh, were asking, uh, you could see again here that just about one third had the uh, ABS systems and only 12% had traction control. I think today is basically all motorcycles, uh, including in the ABS system, have the traction control. And again, the important part was that 35% did not use their brakes. So we need to work with training. We maybe consider in the driving license education that we should focus better on training. Uh, with break, breaking. Um, and the other part which are interesting also is that um, that 65% of the riders uh, that went to hospital were traveling under 70 kilometers an hour. And speed is not the thing that, that have a strong effect on injury severity. You could say, or you, the conclusion is that it is a matter about how is your, your trajectory uh, in the crash? What do you end up in? And 
this is a thing we will speak more about uh, because it has to do with the uh, infrastructure. So we could say if we compare to a racing where we create a very safe environment, um, we, we do not see the same uh, effect as there is nothing people are getting uh, uh, into. So we can do the next slide. So this is basically, I would say, the most important in my presentation here. And this is the, the wish list from the motorcycle riders. And it's okay to put up a lot of wishes when it's close to Christmas. Uh, the answers you, you see here is also a result of, we did a quick uh, survey on, on, the, uh, on the internet and asked the riders just to be sure that, that we were getting uh, the majority of things. So what is very important is that governments and road owners, they must focus on and show that motorcycles are part of Vision Zero because the riders don't have that feeling. Uh, and I would say we had Vision Zero for so long time. We have so many motorcycles in the world. We have probably the leading a group of uh, victims in, in uh, road traffic accidents are users of power two wheelers. So I think this must be a reasonable uh, wish. Next is a very important, and this is also, it's part of, of this point is that the road owners, they should actually follow their own uh, book of rules for how do we con construct our infrastructure? And that is, of course, that we have a predictable friction, we have a smooth uh, road surface, um, we have no dangerous roadside objects. And here we are back to, uh, to the conclusions of uh, Winkelbauer earlier also. Uh, it's better to remove a guardrail which would actually kill or harm seriously a motorcycle rider if there is a possibility to make a, a simple runoff zone. And we should absolutely be able to develop a good for all uh, users of the roads uh, guardrail. What we see um, in the in-depth studies we, we do in Sweden is we see some very nasty accidents because the riders have the ABS, they don't slide into the guardrail, they, the bike are standing up when they hit the guardrail. And you saw again on Martin's film, we were lucky the rider didn't hit the, the guardrail uh, as such. But normally you end up and you slide on top of the guardrail. This means the backside will tear you apart. So we have to have a top on, on, on the guardrail and, and some kind of protection, even on the backside. And this should be possible. We have uh, a, a change in the car park to heavier cars which are challenging the existing uh, standards for guardrails. We should pay attention to visibility uh, and the Connected Motorcycle Consortium will come with part of this, but it's very easy to chop down a tree or whatever which can give visibilities. We should let the riders use the, the bus lanes uh, we see filtering that was in as a, um, as, a, as a question, and I can say that USA, most of the states are allowing it, uh, but it's easier to let us use the bus lanes, which we have in nearly all over Europe. And if we have better parking facilities, we can reduce uh, theft. And, and uh, hereby we can have decent riders uh, out. The driving license is a uh, 
is a good question. We agree that education and good education is a must. It must be based on risk and accident focus. Uh, and we also think that all types of drivers, uh, riders, should learn about other vehicles too. However, we should not make it too complicated because then it's getting too expensive. And unfortunately, we then will have a group of people who want to be in the traffic, but they don't follow the rules. What we see in Norway, we see it in Sweden when we start to analyze in depth, is that one third on average of fatalities are having no valid license to ride a motorcycle. This group likes or are frequent uh, intoxicated of drugs and alcohols. They don't follow any rules. They go far too fast. And this is a huge problem. So we could reduce uh, motorcycle fatalities with one third if we could take these away, at least in these two countries. So I, I really recommend we start to look into this in other countries too. Uh, and, and because there will be so big gains in this. So I think this was the, the wish list from the riders. And, and let me say very uh, loud and clear, it is not dangerous to ride a motorcycle, but it will never be risk-free. You have to do everything right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesper. Thanks. And uh, uh, maybe Santa Claus will decide to come and bring uh, gifts, not with a sledge, but with a motorbike, if he wants to uh, help you with all these uh, um, wish lists. So uh, uh, ready for uh, uh, another session of uh, um, Q&A. So I would uh, uh, love to have uh, um, Jesper and Kai ready for uh, uh, answering the questions. I see the other ones are on all as well. Martin and Jenny, in case there are uh, other questions that are um, related to them. Quite a few. Again, uh, I'll start with Kai. Uh, uh, do you think it could be beneficial to have training, uh, not only for uh, motorcycle users, but also for other road users, in order to allow them to better spot motorcycles in uh, the road environment? Antonio, yes, <laughs> it is very important. Um, you can train motorbike riders in a very good way to get an idea what martin also says in, in the, in the um, earlier stage that they have unexpected behavior and you can train also motorbike riders to to prepare themselves in their head what can be happen in traffic and on the other side you have the other participants in traffic like pedestrians like using a car like uh, losing a lorry or something it's and to train them <clears throat> to get a really good view to motorcycle uh, to motorbike riders this would be very very important so for example if you are riding uh, if if you are driving a car you must be you must have this idea that a motorbike rider can be directly behind this a thing of a car so you cannot see it so they must train them to watch really directly what's happened there. Yeah? Especially when you're country, countryside roads and you want to turn left, for example. And for my side, this is very, very important. But this should also include it in the normal driver education to get a driver license. And it would be fantastic to make a <clears throat> second part of education to get more ideas. So like uh, Austria, the second phase, for example. Thank you, Kai. I see uh, Martin is raising his hand and uh, we have to give him the floor. Uh, thanks a lot. We could start with easy things, actually. Car drivers, use your turn indicators. We take care of ourselves <laughs> in case we know what you want. <laughs> well, well, that's very easy and quite effective. That's all. Thanks. Hey, Martin, I have another question here on uh, the Q&A box. Uh, what do you think about safety training during driving license training, and it should be at the highest level of the GDE. 
um, the problem is how to include these safety questions into the driver license test so that driving schools devote more resources to uh, safety training. Um, well, Kai, Jesper, both of you. So from my opinion, this is this very interesting question. Uh, I prefer that you have this <clears throat> basic driver education in a driving school, but in a driving school, you must have this hazard perception education. It's very, very important. Um, but the safety training, I would make it after getting the driver license so that you have some experience riding a motorbike. And with this personal experience, then you should participate in the safety training to get some good ideas, but you need some some experience of dry of riding a motorbike to have a feeling and a good idea. So make it more um, as an overall system. So integrate everything into basic driver education, and make in some countries a hope mandatory further education. In some countries a voluntary further education, but make it after some yeah weeks, one month, one and a half months with personal driving experience. But it's very important. I, I could agree with, uh, with Kai, because what we have to understand is, if you drive a car and you come into a curb and you, you are too fast, what you do is you simply turn your steering wheel a bit more. You will hear your, your wheel saying, Wee! and then you, uh, you fix it. That's most likely how it will. If you come on a motorcycle, according to your skills, uh, you would, if you are a fully trained rider, you would have to do 23 uh, exactly movements from, from gear, clutch, body position, view, etc. So there's a lot to learn. We have to accept and understand this is the physics of a motorcycle. And all this you won't learn directly in the driver's education because you will be overloaded. It's more important to work with the level you take your risk on. So you, this is important to understand. So if you look at the most, the best success we have seen recent in road safety for motorcycles, these are the, uh, I would call it the dots on the road or the lines of uh, Winkelbauer. And basically what they are doing is that they are teaching uh, how to negotiate with a, with a turn. There is a turn point, there is an uh, apex and an exit. And this is painted on the road, so if it, it's like a self-instruction manual. And, and this is what the rider have to learn, or we have to accept that we have to teach them also how to read the road. Thank you, Jesper. Before we move on to the next uh, question, I actually have also a comment on uh, uh, the Q&A box uh, that comes from uh, uh, Veneta Vasileva at ASEM, uh, uh, and it touches upon uh, uh, different elements which I would like to mention. So first and foremost, congratulations on the webinar that shows once more uh, the importance of the adoption of a safe system approach towards uh, motorcycling, addressing human vehicle and infrastructure factors. Indeed, that's what uh, we saw. Then uh, um, some words about the importance of the Connected Motorcycle Consortium. That is uh, an ex ex excellent example of the efforts to ensure that motorcycling will be part of the future um, connected world. And I think this is something we saw already in uh, uh, the presentation uh, uh, by uh, Martin. And uh, um, of course, also uh, a mention on uh, um, training. Uh, we, we said that um, ASEM uh, is uh, a part of the um, uh, um, quality training label. Um, ASEM believes the high quality training is essential for uh, improved riders uh, uh, performance. Uh, there are 36 training programs certified in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, ASEM, FIM and Academia have decided to uh, develop new training concepts addressing the most relevant power to wheeler accident scenarios and developing a set of cognitive and riding skills necessary to avoid these accident scenarios. So the aim is to create a level system that clusters these skills in groups of increasing abilities, encouraging riders to attend voluntary safety training courses 
on a, a regular basis. Maybe uh, Jesper and, and Kai want to um, comment on this uh, uh, last uh, uh, part of the comment from uh, um, from Asim. I, I can only say that uh, we take now uh, the leading stakeholders in motorcycle training, uh, the biggest one in Europe, and we bring it together with the uh, academia. Uh, we bring in uh, all the science we possibly can get. And I'm very sure we will end up having one of the best concepts for uh, riders training in the world. That's it. Hi. This was a fantastic wish for the future, directly connected to, <laughs> to Christmas. Fantastic. I have no, no more comments. Everything is good. Uh, a question to uh, Jesper from uh, uh, Dolph, Dolph Willingers, formerly uh, at uh, FEMA, about safeguard rails. Uh, uh, manufacturers keep telling us that they are willing to develop them, but there is not enough demand to do the investments on R&D. Uh, there will be no supply without demand. Uh, there is a role for uh, uh, both road safety authorities and uh, uh, riders' organizations to uh, demand uh, about safeguard rates. I would say it in this way that we have a situation where the valuation of a motorcycle rider's life is not uh, set in a level so that we will see the next generation in guard rates. I'm very sure it will come. It just takes an awful lot of time. And to be quite frankly, uh, we have a situation we see in Germany that private people are collecting money uh, and they are paying for installation of motorcycle protection. And I think this is not a situation which we should have the society should build a safe infrastructure under the safe system for all people on the roads. Kai, you want to add anything? No, that's more for... Uh, no, no, not, not in the moment. Okay, very good. Uh, from past to future, Wim Tal, new F uh, FEMA uh, General, General Secretary. Uh, what do Jesper and Kai think about differentiated speed limits for holders of A1, A2, and A motorcycle licenses, something that was recently proposed. I have read this question. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting question because it has two sides. Um, I think to if you have some 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 country roads with very dangerous core, for example, it can be a very good signal to make a special speed limit for motorbike riders to give them a signal it is dangerous here. And we have the same signal also for people who are using a car. So there is something different when motorbike riders have a special speed limit. This is one part. The other part is it can be very dangerous. So <clears throat> when motorbike riders have a special speed limit, so we have some, some very critical situation with car drivers in something like this. So you must be very, very careful to find the right answer. And it depends on the area. I think this is my proposal. It depends on the area and the psychological effects what can be happen. So for this, I would be very, very careful to make different speed limits. It is the same, the same like uh, a special speed limits for novice driver. It is also very dangerous because they can come to very critical situations because of the behavior of others. Huh? So it's, yes. it's not a clear answer. The only answer is be careful with this and think really, really very, very deep. What can be happening there? I would, I would ask re or, or, or reply briefly. We have a major experience in speed differences on the racetracks. It is the most dangerous part on the racetrack because that's how you create collisions. So there must be similar speeds for all uh, out there. Don't make it uh, differentiated. It simply creates too many dangerous situations. Thank you. A last question. Uh, we only have five minutes, but this is a question on which we could build a whole webinar. Uh, in recent years, we've seen an increase in motorcycle users using their vehicle for work, especially for food delivery. Um, we know that these riders are usually driving under pressure, putting themselves and other road users in dangerous 
situations. Uh, do you believe this could become a major road safety issue in the next few years? It's a bit of a rhetoric question, but it allows us to uh, mention this important element of uh, uh, power to wheelers use and uh, road safety. I would say yes, it's absolutely uh, something that everyone has to look into. I am aware that many of these uh, companies having a lot of uh, riders, they are taking a huge responsibility. Uh, I know in Italy, uh, we have one of the stakeholders in the quality seal. They are training, for instance, the Post and, and several other companies. So I'm very sure that, that we will see the quality seal will have another impact into the commercial industry using power to wheelers. We have this problem nowadays in Germany, in big cities in Germany, not on the countryside, but in big cities, we have this problem nowadays. So we make it from the, we see it from the accidents. And my clear message is, there are two messages. To influence these kind of motorbike riders, especially with food delivery. Uh, we have a lot of people from other countries who will make this. So you, must, you must have an idea about this culture background, what's happened there, and find the right measurement to influence the people. And the second thing is, you must make a clear, clear message that the companies are really responsible for the behavior, what their drivers are doing in traffic. And you must change what I think, what I said before, you must give them the right conditions to ride a motorbike in a safe way. It's very important. Uh, I saw Martin raising his hand. Yeah, I'd like to turn on the, the light at, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, when, when we look in uh, uh, academic studies, we find that the safest riders are the ones who drive the most. So probably they have a chance as being the most experienced ones. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, uh, I will. Uh, I I would have some more questions, but we do not have time because it's twelve twenty nine, and I do aim to finish on time. Uh, I think all the participants, which are very numerous until the very end of the seminar, will join me in uh, um, thanking Jenny, Martin, uh, Jessica, uh, Kai. Jesper and uh, uh, all the PIN partners for uh, uh, this support. Uh, this is the last uh, ETSC event in uh, uh, 2023. Uh, we had 26 public events in uh, uh, the year that is just coming to an end, uh, which is, I would say, a decent number for a team of 12 persons uh, uh, working on, uh, on it. Uh, we shall uh, take a short break over um, Christmas, like many of you, and uh, uh, we'll be ready to start again with uh, renewed enthusiasm uh, in uh, 2024. So uh, stay tuned, uh, follow us on the website, on uh, the social media channels, so that uh, you'll be able to be uh, updated on uh, uh, what is uh, um, coming. Uh, the presentations will be soon online. This is a question that I uh, received several times on uh, the Q&A. Uh, you will also be able to uh, uh, watch the uh, seminar again. Uh, what remains for me when it's 12.30 sharp is to wish all of you a safe uh, break, nice Christmas, and uh, uh, see you uh, soon in uh, the new year. Thank you very much. <laughs>